Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is Ascension Sunday. Although, for all of you who are in the Bible study, you already know what I'm going to say next. And that is that Ascension Sunday doesn't actually exist. No, Ascension is always on a Thursday. In fact, it was this last Thursday. You see, Ascension is celebrated in the church 40 days after Easter, marking the 40 days that Christ appeared to the disciples and the believers after his resurrection and before his death. And 40 days after a Sunday always lands on a Thursday. But here we are, Sunday morning, and we look to, we remember Christ and His ascension. You know, it occurred to me as I was preparing for this sermon that I think we tend to think of the ascension in, well, one way. We often think of the ascension as the time when Christ left earth. And this is not the wrong thing to do. That's plainly what is going on. And to be sure, the ascension is the end of the earthly ministry of Christ. Yet, while Christ is no longer present on the earth in his body, we remember also today that As he says in John chapter 14, he has not left us as orphans. And yes, I know that that verse in particular is in reference to next Sunday, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And yes, I know that Christ ascended into heaven to fulfill important works that we discussed with the kids and to be exalted as we discussed in the Bible study. Yet I think there's more going on in Ascension than this. I think there's more going on in this promise that we will not be left as orphans. And even without Christ coming to us bodily, we can remember those parting words of the angels. He will return to you. So I ask the question, how does Christ return to us? Well, I think it's easy for our minds to go to Christ's final return at the end of time in glory. I think it's easy to think that way because that's the direct reference of what the angels are referring to. And I'll be honest, until this week in my prep for this sermon, that is all that I had considered. And so I really don't want to take anything away from that. And yet, as I thought about the ascension, it occurred to me that the ascension, the return even, of Christ is bigger than just His final return. As far as I can tell, there's not one, not two, but four ways that we as Christians can think of, can consider the return of of Christ. First, we can think of Christ returning to us in His Word. Second, Christ returning to us in His sacraments. Third, Christ returning to us upon the moment of our deaths. And then fourth, and most significantly, Christ returning in glory on the last day. And so let's, for a brief moment, take each of these in turn. Christ returns to us through His Word. Let us not forget that Christ is the Word. He is the Word of God made flesh as we often talk about around Christmas time. And by the way, I think there are a lot of connections between Christmas and Advent and Ascension, but that's a different sermon for another year. No, Christ returns to us through His Word. In His Word, we can find Christ coming to us. 
When we open the pages of Scripture and read what is written there, Christ returns. Christ comes to us. Whether we are reading the pages of Scripture alone or whether we read them aloud in a group, when the Word of the Bible is read, Christ is present. At least as much, if not more so, it is when this very Word of God is proclaimed, Christ also returns to us. Whether it is proclaimed from a pulpit or proclaimed in the witness to His name. Whenever the Word of the Word made flesh is proclaimed, Christ there too is present. He's present in the words of forgiveness. We heard them this morning. In the stead and by the command of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. Christ in the forgiveness of sins not only gives the command, but is present in the absolution. Now a lot of the ways that Christ comes to us in His Word are pastor things, and that's very exciting, but don't think that you are being left out of the equation here. No, whenever we, as the body of Christ, share words of faithful encouragement with one another, Christ is present in our midst. As we stand up and shake the same hands of the people who sit in the same pews all around us, sharing the peace of Christ with one another, Christ is there. As we have those conversations... Sometimes difficult, sometimes dear to us. As we encourage the people near to us in their suffering and their difficulties, Christ is there too. Even as we lift one another up in quiet or not so quiet prayers, Christ has come to us. In all these ways, through the Word, Christ is present. Christ returns to us in His Word. He returns to us too in His sacraments. In the waters of baptism, as a child is coming into faith, no matter their age, Christ is present. Christ has enlivened and empowered the waters of holy baptism through His own baptism and through His name and His Word. Baptism has power not because the water is special, but because Christ is present in that sacramental act. And yet, perhaps most clearly of all the ways Christ returns to us, He returns to us through the sacrament of the altar. It is here hidden in with and under bread and wine, that Christ comes to us in His true body and His true blood. Christ at this altar returns to us in a way that our senses can grasp, even if our minds cannot. Faith, though, still takes hold that Christ returns to us in this meal. In, with, and under the bread and wine is Christ. He is present there. Yet even more than that, even though it is the elders and I who are giving and serving communion, we recognize that we are not the host of this meal. Christ not only is present in the elements, but He is present as host, inviting you to His presence. Inviting you to taste and see that He is good. Inviting you to come face to face with your Lord. It is right for us to sing then with Simeon after having held our Savior in our hands. Christ returns to us in His Word. Christ returns to us in His sacrament. And yes, My recent confirmands, I know I could have just said means of grace, but I wanted four things, not three. Christ also returns to us at the moment of our death. And perhaps the most personal revealing of Christ to us, in the moment of our death, we come face to face with our Savior. 
In the moment of our death, we are gathered into the presence of Christ. We are gathered into the faithful host of all the saints. In the moment of our death, we are gathered into peace and perfection in the presence of our Lord. Gathered not quite yet to begin our eternal life. Gathered rather in the presence of God to wait. To wait for that final day. To wait together with Christ and the saints in perfection and peace until the day of our Lord's revealing. Until that day that we typically think about on Ascension Day. The day in which Christ returns as the disciples saw Him go in triumph and glory. That day when all things are made new. The day when God is revealed. Christ is Lord and Savior. And we, the saints of God, are revealed to the world as well. That wonderful and glorious day when every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, and our earthly, bodily, eternal life in the resurrection of the new heavens and the new earth finds its beginning. A beginning which has no end. So today, as we watch with the disciples, As we hear the voice of the angels, let us remember the promise of Christ's return. His return in part now through His Word, through His sacraments, and at the moment of our deaths. And His return in glory. His final return on the last day. In Jesus' name, Amen. And now, may this peace, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in this faith until life everlasting. Amen.